Well, hello, and thank you once again for joining us for the Generations Bible Study. My name is Ken Jobst, and we're involved in a study of the book of Psalms. And we've entitled this study, Psalms, the Heart of Worship. We've been considering uh, basically five psalms from each of the five different divisions in the book of Psalms. And today, the subject of our study is going to be Psalm number 89. Psalm number 89, which uh, interestingly, Psalm number 89 has a couple of things that uh, distinguish it. First of all, it's the second of two psalms that are written by uh, people called Ezraites. Uh, the psalm that we studied last week, Psalm number 88, was by a guy named Heman the Ezraite. And this psalm, Psalm, psalm number 89, is by a, an author called Ethan the Ezraite. So both of these are Ezraite psalms. We'll get into that a little bit more uh, a moment later. But also, Psalm number 89 closes the third section of the book of Psalms. So Psalm number 89 closes with a doxology, which is characteristic of the, the closing books of each section of the Psalms. And the, the doxology here in Psalm number 89 is Psalm 89, verse 52, which reads, Blessed be the Lord forevermore, amen and amen. So those doxologies... Um, are characteristic of the closing verses of the psalms that end the, the segments of the book of psalms. But today let's consider psalm number 89, and I, I do uh, have kind of a, a, a title for this psalm. This, this is a psalm that I would say is a psalm for learning how to praise God when you don't feel like it. A psalm for learning how to praise God when you don't feel like it. And I mentioned this last week. Psalm 88 and Psalm 89 go together like macaroni and cheese, like peas and carrots. They're, they're a, two psalms that are paired together for very good reason. Not only their authorship being both by Ezraites, but by their content as well. And so we're going to see that. This is, by the way, this is a, a little bit of a longer psalm. Once again, it's 52 verses. But in terms of its structure, its structure is uh, kind of simple. Uh, the, the, the structure basically is this, that the psalm opens and goes for 37 verses of praise. So it's, it's 37 verses of praising God. And then in verse 38, the entire tone of the psalm shifts. And, and it goes from a pretty sustained and jubilant praise to a problem, right? Uh, and the, the problem is a significant problem in the, the theology, in, in our understanding of God. And so this Ezraite... Ethan sets out to praise for 39 verses, excuse me, for 37 verses. Verse 38, we get the, the tonal shift, and it becomes very, very serious, and there, there is a problem that's brought forth. But then, following the presentation of the problem, we, we come around to understanding more of God's providence, and we're going to see that in the closing 10 or so verses of the, the psalm. So it begins with praise, it encounters the problem, but the problem is resolved through God's providence. Praise, problem, providence. Now, uh, so you know, if you don't have time for the rest of the video, here's, here's kind of the, the key to this whole thing. Put the praise first. We, we have to be able to nurture an attitude of praise in our lives before we get to the problem. So often what we want to do is we encounter a problem in life and we focus on that problem. And we think when the problem gets resolved, 
then I can praise. Oh, no, no, no. It doesn't work like that. Nope, nope. You, you, you have to have that attitude of praise in your heart when you encounter the problem to be able to see through the problem all the way to God's providence, how God was seeing ahead, right? Provident, you know, pro, video, you know, seeing ahead. How God's ability to see ahead encompasses what we thought was a problem. So what we saw as a problem was actually a necessary step in God's handling the situation and, and growing us through the situation. Anyway, let's take a look and we're going to dive in Psalm number 89, verse 1. Well, let's start with the title. The title is this, A Contemplation of Ethan the Ezraite. Psalm 89. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Now, I want to stop right here. This is just verse 1 of Psalm number 89. And when, when I was coming along, uh, you know, this is back in the uh, middle 80s, you know. This, this verse was used as a uh, praise song in a lot of American Christian churches. Uh, it was uh, a, a, a peppy praise song. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. I will sing, I will sing. You, you, you may remember that one. Now, here's the thing. This is, this is what fools us. This one verse taken out of the context, right, and made a one-verse little praise song sets us up to think this psalm is going to be a peppy, happy praise psalm. It's actually dealing with one of the most significant theological issues anyone has ever dealt with. Yeah, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. But for those of you for whom this opening verse uh, brings memories of a popular youth group praise song, I just want to give a little tip of the hat to you there. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, says verse 1. With my mouth I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. For I have said mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. Now, I want to make a comment right here. I think this is, this is important for us. And the, the comment is this. What's being described here is an everlasting singer who is singing an everlasting song, right? It says, I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever, right? So I, I've got a song I'm going to sing, and I'm going to be the singer. So it's an everlasting song and an everlasting singer. With my mouth, I will make known your faithfulness to all generations. Let me, let me pause right there. Um, all generations and forever. You know, the, the, the psalmist is using some words to describe long lengths of time, right? Forever and to all generations. And it, it got me to thinking this. When we read the Bible, especially when we read the Old Testament, we find, for example, Abraham and the patriarchs had a very long understanding of the future, right? That, that they had an understanding of future generations that somehow or another were figured into their calculus for making a decision today. Let me put that a different way. Characteristic of Abraham and many of the patriarchs. I'm just looking in the book of Genesis, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, you know, Joseph, his brothers. One of the characteristics is that they would make decisions today thinking about the impact of those decisions on generations yet unborn, right? They, they let me say it this way, they took the long view. And that's something that, that has captured my attention. 
you know, e even, uh, for example, in the book of Job, th there's a long time and planning horizon that, that Job and the patriarchs and many in the Old Testament take into account. Now, I say that because I live in and you live in a contemporary world in which we don't tend to think about the long, long-term impact of our decisions and actions. You know what? Uh, most companies in America, right, you know, most, uh, um, if you're a Fortune 500 company, typically your greatest energies are devoted to your next quarter's profits. So that gives you a planning horizon, right, and a concern horizon of about 90 days. Now, sure, yeah, we understand you got to build a company and yada, yada, and infrastructure and all that. But, but by and large, we're, as a culture, as a society, Americans have a very, very close planning horizon. We tend not to think about the impact of our today decisions on people 100 years from now or 50 years from now, or five years from now, right? We, uh, for us, the future is like right up here in our faces. We, we don't see long, long, long term. And why does that concern us? Well, it, it concerns me for a number of reasons. First of all, uh, probably in our lifetimes, the, the biggest thing that is uh, pressing in terms of future generations is the whole notion of climate change, right? What, what, what crimes are we committing today, and I use the word crimes, that we don't recognize them as a crime today, but they're actually a crime against future generations. For example, you know, I drove my car here today, uh, driving a six-cylinder gas, you know, gasoline vehicle that I'm pretty sure 100 years from now if there are people driving gasoline vehicles, it's going to be looked upon at least as an oddity, right? It would be like if somebody's driving a Model T outside. Or perhaps at worst, it will have been seen as a crime because you were not only depleting the natural resources of the earth, but you were polluting the air, right, and, and all this other stuff. So it might be a crime against future generations to put all that carbon dioxide into the, the atmosphere. Because how is that, you know, that's going to increase global warming. It's going to make life on Earth so much more difficult. Well, that, that's one example, right? Could give the example of, um, you know, nuclear energy. Um, yeah, we can run a nuclear power plant today, but what do you do with the spent fuel? Well, you've got to find a place to keep that spent fuel safe for 120,000 years, and how are you going to do that? That may be seen as uh, a snub to future generations. What about national debt, right? We're, we're hovering around, do we, we, I think we've got a trillion or two, you know, one trillion dollars of national debt, and the interest clock is still running on that. So we are encumbering future generations with a tremendous burden that they're going to have to carry. I bring all of that up to say that basically what we're looking at here is we have a culture that doesn't look too far into the future to uh, consider its impacts. That's in stark contrast with, the, you know, the, Ethan the Ezraite, who is talking about singing this song for future generations. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever because there will never come a generation that does not need to know about God's mercy. There will never come a generation that does not need to hear about the saving power of God. So I, I just lift that up that time perspective wise, you know, and let me tell you, one of the, I invested uh, some time in a good Bible study, just a, a, a personal individual study of time in the Bible. And that's, that's something to, to think about. But let, let's continue in verse 2. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Your faithfulness you shall establish in the very heavens. Now, 
before I continue, I, I want you to, to see that in these first 37 verses, there are two big themes being built up. The themes are these. The faithfulness of God and the mercy of God. So whenever you hear, whenever you hear the term faithfulness, whenever you read the term mercy, right, that's the theme for these opening 37 verses. Verse 3. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn to my servant David, your seed I will establish forever and build up your throne to all generations. Selah. Which means, think about this. Right? Pay particular attention. I'm going to build up your throne to all generations. Okay. I'm selah in that right now. Thinking about that, I've circled it in my notes. I'm going to think about that his throne is going to be built up through all generations. Let's put a pin in that for when we get to verse 38. Okay? All right. And the heavens will praise your wonders, O Lord, your faithfulness also in the assembly of the saints. For who in the heavens can be compared to the Lord? Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened to the Lord? God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And he is held in reverence by all those around him. O Lord God of hosts, who is mighty like you, O Lord, your faithfulness also surrounds you. You rule the raging of the sea. When its waves break, you still them. You have broken Rahab in pieces as one who is slain. You have scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. Let me say a word about that Rahab right there, right? Uh, when, when we look at the word Rahab in the Bible, you know, sometimes it's a name. It's a proper name. You've got Rahab, you know, in, in Jericho. But also Rahab is used in at least two other senses, right? Uh, Rahab as the primordial chaos um, you know, creature, like, like Leviathan what was a, a sea creature uh, and a monster. Let's put it that way, kind of a sea monster kind of thing was Leviathan. And sometimes Rahab was seen as a, a, a version of Leviathan. But also Rahab... Right, which which literally translated means proud one, the the, the proud one who has lifted themselves up. Uh, that that Rahab has been taken to be a nickname for Egypt. Now that's going to be important in in a couple of minutes, but uh, so Rahab is being mentioned here, but it's a Rahab that's been broken into pieces and is slain, and is scattered with the enemies of God. All right. Verse 11. The heavens are yours, the earth also is yours. The world in all its fullness, you have founded them. The north and the south, you've created them. Tamor and Hermon, rejoice in your name. You have a mighty arm. Strong is your hand, and high is your right hand. By the way, the right hand is always seen as the what where skill and power and strength reside. So to say that God has, a, a high is your right hand, saying that God is all powerful. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth go before your face. Wait, wait a minute. That sounded, all, let me read that again. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth before your face. Righteousness and justice, mercy and truth. Righteousness and justice, mercy and truth. Those four terms were central to our understanding of the previous psalm, psalm number 88. So I think if we look back in Psalm 88.10, we, we see those terms once again. And here's another Ezraite who has linked all these terms together. Uh, th there's, a, there's a theme going on here. Blessed are the people who know the joyful sound. They walk, O Lord, in the light of your countenance. In your name they rejoice all day long. By, by the way, to walk in the light of the countenance of God. Countenance means face. And, and to walk in the light of God's face is another poetic way of saying that they are enjoying God's favor. When, when someone turns to you and they're facing you, 
they are giving you their complete attention. And so they, they are there for you. So when we talk about the light of God's countenance being upon us, which is part of the great Aaronic blessing and benediction, that's saying that may you enjoy the favor of God. We continue now, uh, verse 16 and 17, and in your righteousness they are exalted. Verse 17, for you are the glory of their strength, and in your favor our horn is exalted. That, that is, in your favor we have strength. The horn is a, an emblem of strength, right? The, the ox has horns, and that's characteristic of strength. For our shield belongs to the Lord and our king to the Holy One of Israel. Then you spoke in a vision to your Holy One and said, I have given help to one who is mighty. I have exalted one chosen from the people. I have found my servant David. With my holy oil I have anointed him. With whom my hand shall be established, also my arm shall strengthen him. The enemy shall not outwit him, nor the son of wickedness afflict him. I will beat down his foes before his face and plague those who hate him. But my faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. We're, we're, we're talking about the Davidic dynasty, right? My faithfulness and my mercy shall be with him. And in my name, his horn shall be exalted. That is, in my name, his strength shall be exalted. Also, I will set his hand over the sea and his right hand over the rivers. He shall cry to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. Also, I will make him my firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. By mercy, I will keep him forever. And by my covenant shall stand firm with him. And his, his seed I will make to endure forever, and his throne as the days of heaven. Watch. Once again, we're getting those themes of faithfulness and mercy, right? We're continuing in that, that faithfulness and mercy theme, but we're also seeing that that time dimension is, is being introduced there as well. So it's a, it's a tremendous uh, development of those major themes. Verse 30, if his sons forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with the rod and their iniquity with stripes. Nevertheless, my loving kindness I will not utterly take from them, nor allow my faithfulness to fail. My covenant I will not break, nor alter the word that has gone out from my lips. Now, watch. In the Old Testament, the notion of God as a covenant-keeping God. Remember, a covenant is a, a deal. And, and when God says, I'm in on this deal, God cannot lie. So God's word is unbreakable, right? And he said, look, I'm in on this covenant. Once I have sworn by my holiness, I will not lie to David. His seed shall endure forever. Once again, that time thing, forever and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever like the moon, even like the faithful witness in the sky, Selah. So, we've gone through these first 37 verses. It's been a hymn of praise to God for his faithfulness, for his mercy, recognizing his strength and his might and his sovereignty, his justice, truth, favor, covenantal love. All of that has been praise of God for 37 verses. Now, we come to verse 38. Watch how the tone of the entire psalm shifts. Ready? But, now, now this is that conjunction. It's going to turn us in a different direction here. But, you have cast off and abhorred. You have been furious with your anointed. You have renounced the covenant of your servant. You have profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You have broken down all his hedges. You have brought his strongholds to ruin. All who pass by the way plunder him. He is a reproach to his neighbors. You have exalted the right hand of his adversaries. You have made all his enemies rejoice. You have also turned back the edge of his sword and have not sustained him in battle. You have made his glory cease and cast his throne down to the ground. 
the days of his youth you have shortened. You have covered him with shame, Selah. Wow, o okay. There, from verse, from verse 38 through verse 45, you've got the problem. We've been talking about the praise for 37 verses worth of a very comprehensive praise of God. But then when we get to verse 38, what do we have? We've got the problem laid forth. And here's the problem. God, you've been talking about this Davidic dynasty that you would uphold the, the, the throne of David into all generations and through the future and forever and ever, amen, and all this kind of business. But you're actually furious with our, your anointed. You've renounced the covenant from your servant. You've broken down the hedge of protection that you put around him. You've profaned his crown by casting it to the ground. You've toppled over his throne. You've made his glory cease. What's up with this, God? What's going on? So, uh, but by the way, what is going on? But, but because this is, this is very, very strong language here. Uh, we, let, let me continue in verse 46. How long, Lord, will you hide yourself forever? Will your wrath burn like fire? Remember how short my time is. For what futility have you created all the children of men? What man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Selah. Oh my goodness. Wow. Wow. Here's the problem. God, you are all-knowing, you are all-powerful, and you cannot lie. And you, you, you made a covenant with David that David would always have a successor on the throne. And now, everything's gone haywire. How has it gone haywire? It's gone haywire because another country has come along and toppled over the throne, right? That They have cast down the, uh, cast down the crown of David, and things are, things are not good. Let me, let me bring us back just for a moment to the mention of Rahab. Remember uh, when we were all the way back in verse 10, the psalmist mentions Rahab being broken into pieces. And we said that's a, that's a, a word picture, that that's a code term for Egypt. Well, let me bring you to 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 25 through 27. Because these psalms, remember, these psalms are being sung in the, the temple. They're part of worship. But they're related to historical events. Here's the historical event that's being related to. Right? You ready? From 1 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, right, son of Solomon. In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assign those to his commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went into the Lord's temple, the guards bore the shields, and afterwards they returned them to the guard room. Now, whoa, what's that saying? Shishak, king of Egypt, came and trashed Israel, right? And took all the loot out of the palace and took all the loot out of the temple and took it back to Egypt. So when Solomon had made big shields, you know, like, like four feet, three and a half feet across circular shields, and, and, you know, they have the weight of the gold that went into each shield is recorded in the scripture. Shishak came along and looted all that stuff, took it back to Egypt. And, you know, what, what did poor Israel do? Well, instead of having gold shields, they made bronze shields, right? The gold shields probably cost something on the order. If you want to replace them, they'd be like $80,000 each to, to replace. The bronze ones, eh, you get them for like 12, 15 bucks, right? And watch, it's saying that after the soldiers used the shield, they, they had to sign them out the bronze ones. They had to sign them out and then sign them back in again just to keep inventory control on the bronze. 
back in the day, they had so much bronze, they didn't care about it. Nobody kept records of it back in Solomon's day. Now, a few years later, Shishak, king of Egypt, has come along, stolen all the gold, and just left them with bronze. So now they have to keep track of the bronze. I, I want to give you just one more, one more passage that tells about this from 2 Chronicles chapter 12. After Rehoboam's position as king was established and he had become strong, he and all Israel with him abandoned the law of the Lord. Because they had been unfaithful to the Lord, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam. Watch, watch. Uh, okay, just five years passed, and everything went to, you know. <laughs> the wheels fell off five years into the kingdom. Mm. Verse 3. With 1,200 chariots and 60,000 horsemen and the innumerable troops of the Libyans, Succites, and Cushites that came with him from Egypt, he captured the fortified cities of Judah and came as far as Jerusalem. Then the prophet Shemaniah came to Rehoboam and the leaders of Judah who had assembled in Jerusalem for fear of Shishak, and he said to them, This is what the Lord says, You've abandoned me. Therefore, now... I abandon you to Shishak. The leaders of Israel and the king humbled themselves and said, The Lord is just. When the Lord saw that they had humbled themselves, this word of the Lord came to Shemaiah. Since they have humbled themselves, I will not destroy them, but will soon give them deliverance. My wrath will not be poured out on Jerusalem through Shishak. They will, however, become subject to him so that they may learn the difference between serving me and serving the kings of other lands. When Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem, he carried off the treasures of the temple of the Lord and the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards went with him, buried in the shields, and afterward they returned to the guard room. Now, okay, you see what happened. Egypt came along, trashed the temple, you know, looted everything out. Now, let's, let's, wrap, up, let's wrap up the closing verses. These are the closing verses of, of Psalm number 89. Lord, where are your former loving kindnesses, which you swore to David in your truth? Remember, Lord, the reproach of your servants, how I bear in my bosom the reproach of all the many peoples with which your enemies have reproached, O Lord, and which they have reproached the footsteps of your anointed. Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. So, that the, the progress of the psalm goes from the praise to the problem to the providence. That somewhere in God's calculus, somewhere in God's understanding, this has to make some sort of sense. Now, let me ask the question, because th this is a profound question. Um, remember Psalm 88 that we covered last, last week? Uh, and we said that maybe it was a leper who wrote this, and I, I said, wow, it really applies certainly to people struggling with Alzheimer's. Recall, Psalm 88 is a song about personal darkness. It's about the individual. It's about individual adversity. Now, Psalm 89 is about national darkness, right? It's about a collective adversity that has befallen a people. So if you take Psalm 88, that personal darkness, and, and Psalm 89, which is a collective national darkness, then, wow, you're covering a whole lot of territory right there. The, remember, the hope part of Psalm 88 comes in the very first line, and it's, it's you know, God of my salvation, Psalm 88. The hope part in Psalm, Psalm 89 is coming at the end with God's providence. Now, here's a big question. With no Davidic king, right, or, or a, a king that is basically powerless, because we see that, that God said, look, I'm not going to 
pull the rug right out from under you with Shishak, king of Egypt. That day is going to come later with Babylon, right? But in, in whatever circumstance, whether we're talking about Babylon or Egypt, let me ask this question. Have the promises of God failed? Wow. If they've not failed, where are they? If they've not failed, what good are they? Now, you know, okay. You could say, look, I've never been a king. I'm, I'm not the king of Judah. I'm not the king of my neighborhood block. You know, uh, uh, so, so what's, this, what's this all got to do with me? Well, you know what? Um, what if you sense the Lord gave you uh, like a divine reassurance and it felt like a covenant had been made between you and God with respect to maybe uh, marriage, you know, that, that, that God has assured me that, yes, indeed, I'm going to get married. And then, you know, nothing happens. You don't meet anybody. Uh, oh, oh, wait a minute. Or you do meet somebody and you get married, but you're not happily married. Oh, wow. What happened to God's covenant? What, what if you sensed all the way growing up that, that the most important thing in your life or one of the most important things in your life was going to be parenthood and you wanted to have the experience of being a, being a you know, mother or a father and you know, enjoying children and all that sort of thing. But you, you, you feel as though God made that covenant with you, but tick, tick, you know, time passes and, and there, there's no children. Um, or you have children and they're a disappointment, right? What became of God's covenant? Or, or if God gave you the ability to develop a particular skill or a particular ministry, and it's something that you really wanted to do for the glory of God within the body of Christ, uh, and then you get sick and you can't do the ministry that you feel you've been called to. What happened to the promise of God? Now, I want you to understand this because this is crucial. This is huge. This, this right here is big. I want you to understand what's going on with Psalm number 89. Please notice that this is a theological crisis, a national theological crisis that is being sung about in worship. It's a psalm. It, 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 and so people are perplexed about this. And where do they turn? They, they don't just gripe and grouse and write letters to the editor. They bring it to the Lord in prayer. They bring it to the Lord in praise. They bring it, in to, the, they bring it to church. And they lay it out at the foot of the altar. And they say, Lord, you know, please show me the way forward through all of this. Sometimes, you know, we, we go to church and we may have all the answers, but more often than not, we go to church and we're perplexed about something. We want to know, God, why is this like this? I thought that things were going to be going in a different way. I thought you had opened doors for me, but now I'm getting pushed back. Well, that, that perplexity is something that the psalmist is teaching us. We have to praise our way through. And one of, the things that, one of the things that I think this psalm is teaching us is that there is a profound difference between suffering and suffering with hope. And I think both in terms of Psalm 88 and Psalm 89, that's the distinction. That there's going to be suffering. There will be personal, private suffering. And, and there will be suffering on a national scale that, you know, that everyone is aware of. Uh, th there's a little saying that everyone you meet today is fighting a desperate battle that you know nothing about. That's the Psalm 88. But we live in times where the perplexity and the confusion is, is open to all, you know, and it's like, wow, in, in this uh, election year, right, there, there's a lot of stuff that could be going down in the next 
a week or so. So the key to Psalm 88 and the key to Psalm 89, the key to our lives today in the 21st century is this, that we need to believe in God's providence even when, let me say especially when, we don't understand it. We need to understand that God is going to, Romans 8, 28, this thing, that all things are going to work together for our good and to God's glory. It's, it's, a, it's a powerful lesson. And let, let me tell you, not everybody is going to necessarily receive this take on Psalm 88 and Psalm 89. Sometimes we're too close to it. Sometimes it's too personal. Sometimes it hurts too much. But as we can lean on the providence of God, then we're going to see that God indeed will be using all of these things to God's glory and to our good. And because of that, we can sing that doxology that's included as the 52nd verse to Psalm 89, which is, Blessed be the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Well, once again, thank you for being along for the, uh, the study of Psalm number 89. I want to let you know that next week we're going to uh, get into the fourth section of the book of Psalms. And we're going to do that by going directly to Psalm number 90, which is unique in the collection. And I've got a lot to say, a lot to say about Psalm number 90. And I think you will too. So I encourage you, go ahead and read Psalm 90 and we'll get together with it soon. Let's have a word of prayer together. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your providence that, uh, that, that you are sovereign and that you are all wise and all loving and gracious and faithful to each and every one of us. We thank you for your mercy, Lord. We thank you that you are a, a, a covenant-keeping God. Even when we can't, to, you know, even when we can't understand the fullness of the picture that you're painting, still, Lord, we recognize that we can put our complete trust in you. Lord, we thank you for those members of the uh, Generations Bible Study. We pray that you would continue to be with them, Lord. Uh, keep them safe. Strengthen them in this time. We thank you for our church and for our pastor. Pray that you would continue to pour out your blessing. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, thanks for joining us and hope to see you soon. Once again, this is Ken Jobst with the Generations Bible Study. Until next time, God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye.